So, hi everybody, my name is uh, Tom. Uh, I'm going a little bit faster, but I like to say, call myself an open data entrepreneur. So, this talk can go many ways. You can steer me any way you want to go. And very much, I like interaction, so do interrupt me during the talk. Um, and I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So I want to inspire you, I want to tell you some good stuff, some bad stuff that happened to me as an entrepreneur and where you keep going on top. So, I'm 47 now. I started my first company when I was 27. I raised 4 million, so that's a fat startup, a scale up to do. I burned a lot of that money, I learned a lot doing that. It's still around the company, I still own half of it. It's called Casus, it's in uh, local offices. It's matchmaking people who are doing home decoration and home improvement with good contractors. So I thought 20 years ago, so I, was, I was renovating my own house. How come that's not around? I build it. And as an entrepreneur, it's often what you do. You see an opportunity in the market, you try to fix it. Um, my two late startups are data.be, which is using, it's aggregating open data on the companies. I'll tell you more about that later. And legs.be, which is a legal tech, which is using law text and um, case law to mine and to find a correlation and links between. And then I do a little bit of seed investing. I was here this, month, this morning for a legal fund for Checkroom, which is a great local game startup. You should keep an eye on it because they're not talked about as much as Showpad and Team Leader, but I think that uh, they're doing it the lean way. It'll take a little longer, but it's going to be a great way. So a lot of respect for Vincent for having that. Uh, I have the pleasure to be the chairman of Open Knowledge and uh, back to give the Previous speaker, he uh, was one of the co-founders of this nonprofit, and so it has grown over the years. Uh, and I, I'm actually putting a picture. I'll go to the picture first because I couldn't make last night. That was our general assembly last night, and we are looking for fresh blood. So this is my warm call to all of you. If you like what you heard from Bart and Joran on Open Data, and if you like a little bit of what you heard from me tonight. Please do join us. It can be very limited organizing activities, open organizing local chapters, working on a project that contributes to open data. We are a grassroots organization and we just want to create a world where there's more um, open knowledge to create that power for the many and not the few. So that's our, our, our basic baseline. Where our office is, is on top of the central station in Brussels. If you ever travel through there, just go up in the building. And uh, ask for open knowledge, and there's uh, there's three uh, full-time employees there that will love to talk to you about the project at hand. We're part of a larger, uh, we have an international we have an umbrella of Belgian open data and open science and open everything initiatives. We have Open Knowledge International, which has uh, CCAN. The CCAN standard is the standard used to for open for many open data portals. I don't know if the Ghent one is using it. No, the data tech. So, but yeah, that was early days, so it's a, it's a, another flavor that doesn't matter. Um, the thing about open data is freely used, modified, and shared for anyone for any purpose. Now, you asked the question about uh, ethnic profiling. That would be any purpose. On the other side, you still have the law. In Belgium, it's not allowed to do that. It's not allowed to do the national statistic information to do ethnic profiling. It's allowed to forbid. And so we have these huge tension fields nowadays where anybody in this room who can fiddle around with correlation in data sets and who has the element from which you can deduce ethnicity can come to these conclusions. But you are prevented from publicly publishing that result because uh, the, the politicians have decided that that's not something where we want to go. And so there's this huge tension field nowadays of I was a policy maker. I would say, let's open it. I, I don't care in which neighborhood I have how much crime. People probably know if they live there that there is more broken windows in around, in, in, around their neighborhood than in the other neighborhoods. And then address it and explain the context of the data and the errors in there and get the feedback loop going and get the policy going so that they're ashamed of having such a neighborhood. So that would be my personal approach to open data. Yeah? And so the fact of knowing that there is more crime under certain people with a certain ethnic background, it's just poverty. Poor people arrive in poor neighborhoods and so they have, their way to, to get access to money is easier to cram than others. You just explain basic sociology it has nothing to do with closing the data set of people not being allowed to know that in that neighborhood there's no crime. So that's my personal opinion on that. So I, I think politicians should stop hiding between this is sensitive. Just open it up. Yeah? And then the GDPR, yes, it's an ally because it helps us to think responsibly about 
What do you do with data? Why do you collect? How will you reuse it? And each of us in this room should have the ethical standards to think very well, okay, I can do many things technically, but why do I collect it and what, to what end will it pos possibly be misused? And that's the thing you have to try to keep in mind when you work in the data and the open data industry. To which extent can my solutions be misused? But on the other hand, you have to stay open and positive and look for the great good and for the good in, in mankind. So we went through this one. The origin of our nonprofit is not just this little summer project in Ghent where they, they got a great event together, but the origin is a student here who was very close to Kopak in 2008. And we're, we're talking about decades here, so we're going with a little bit of time traveling on trains here. In 2008, students scraped the website of the national train company and got a cease and desist letter. Whoa, those data are not open and public, they're ours. We have database rights. These are train tables. We're a train company. Who do you think you are if you allow this? These were also the high days of the apps. The Belgian rail company didn't have a decent app, didn't have a decent website. And so this website was much better than the, than the train company. So the users went there. It's called Iro, it's still around. And so at the genesis of our nonprofit, Iro is the base base. The amazing thing, and the, 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 the fun thing for me, and so yeah, my Twitter handle is stone. Everything I bring you, feel free to uh, retweet it. You're that much uh, into the attention hoary. Um, but in 2000, um, what date was it? 2016, we had the then marketing manager of NMBS on stage of all events saying like, we are open data. Our data are, are, are yours. So it only took 2000, 2016 to change a company from we claim database rights on train tables to admit that like, there's much more for us in if everybody uses the open real-time train data. Because then if you open up whatever proprietary route planner or intramural route planner, if it's Google's or Waze or Compton's, I don't care, you can add the option public transport. And so we can sell more tickets. And in 2008, they were already selling tickets. They, they were still in this vision. And so each of you and your companies, please think about the greater goods. The train tables were not something that were crucial for them. It was a byproduct. If you want to try and run trains, you need it. And so we went on with the project. We, we, uh, we didn't close the site down, and it, but we created the legal structure which became open knowledge value. That's the origin. Now these things continue to happen. So they were claiming open data. We said, yeah, although you claim, and they were really claiming, we said, it's not really open. Because when we go to your beloved data sets and we, we applaud the initiative, you need to go, the conditions under which information is applied described in the license and the term of use and the restrictions of reuse. And as I gave you our definition before, it's unrestricted. They want to know, you need to register to get access to it. So in our definition, we tell them, please don't start mixing up and open data washing everything. Call it public data, we're okay with that. And so they renamed it to public data, which again, we, we applaud and it shows also that they're honest with themselves, but it's not just about that. And so we do a lot of education. Now, there's other things, sorry for the French article here, but address data. Something as basic and standard as admin. Each of you is managing any database or any unstructured. There's address data in there, right? Has anybody of you ever been working anywhere where you didn't have address data? A street name? No? You're all lucky and spoiled with address data. Well, this happened when we were at the unfortunate bomb attacks in Brussels. Police went to the wrong address, the wrong apartment, because it wasn't classified right? Because there's no unified way of classifying addresses in Belgium. We used to have, we used that, we used to have, it was a huge project, best address. <laughs> Maybe question for that. Who thinks, for those who live somewhere, that the address is yours? You're a home, oh, those who are happy enough to be homeowners or apartment, do you feel that this address is yours? Nobody feels that? Like Okay, so every week I have a website that is sharing address data. People go like, I want you to remove this address. Yeah, but you have a business on that address. It's mine. I own the house on that address. Very good, but I'm not saying it's you, nor that it's your house. I'm just saying it's, it's my address. People feel that they own addresses. And they have, I heard about GDPR, it's my address. You have to remove it. I have the right for it. We get every single week, I get requests, and you get, you get excited about it. And your brother is a lawyer, and my brother is going to sue you, and it will cost you a lot of money if you don't honor my request. And we explain this happens in Earth. Address are being decided and created by the city. The city of Kent is creating a street name. If they find that the street name is no longer appropriate, they change it. You can't claim like, but that was my favorite street name. Too bad. 
city overlooking. If they create a new plot of uh, verkavelingen or uh, whatever they uh, new house, housing projects, they create street names. They decide upon it. So the city decides. Then it goes for Flanders and the Flashman Fields, in Brussels to the Brussels region, Berlin to the Berlin region. And they all manage that in different ways. So at the Belgian level, nobody had the oversight on how in Belgium are addresses and where do they originate from and how do you already how do you how do you normalize them? So there was a European inspection. That's the good thing about those European directives. And this one is a 2007 one, the GDPR is a lot more recent, but those they obliged the member states to get some structure in there. And so it only took 2007, 2019 to make it into the Belgian address. And I won't go into the into the details here because it's going to be very just to show you buildings are in there, parcels, wharves, stuff, and everything has metadata linked to it. So you can do a lot with that. Components, typical components you have. And the interesting point there is in the old days, this is a nightmare. If you have a structured database, you give four characters to zip codes. That's as of one five thousand fifteen. There's a new standard. Oh my God! Any thank cards for that? Yes, you do. And so this is showing how something mundane as a as an alphanumeric numeric uh, address can become a nightmare when you have big data project when you need to normalize it. And so right now the common structures. Yes, I'm not gonna go in there, but so that's one. And then the last project I'm really proud of that one, and I can say we we uh, we got. Our, our little nonprofit changed something there. The election data a few weeks, weeks ago, we found out a few months ago, we asked like, can we get the election data in real time? He said, no, you have to buy, pay for that. Like, what? You pay for democratic election results? So these are the election results on the, on the evening of the elections. They are being sold to the media. And so we found out that six media groups, because they resell them in Germany, six groups bought a license. Which is weird because the election results is not something as a government you would expect to be monetized. They sold this so that on the television you can have those like, and to, here is the ask like from Kent, we have five uh, voting stations that have been counted and we see a trend and so if this continues, there's going to be this. Business. Those data were being sold. And so we contested this with a lot of uh, uh, cold feet fear from the government. They invited us, this department. And this was a very weird meeting because at that meeting we had like people who came to our conferences for years who are open data. They work in the government. We have now planted the seeds. We have the people working in the government and they had gone to the contract with the supplier that was selling the data. And so they weren't selling the data. They were selling the support on how to integrate and interpret and, and process the data, which was some ill-documented unknown proprietary data form. But, so, that, so we said, you know what? We don't need any explanations. Just give us best effort. If we ask a question, you might reply to us. We ask one email the questions. Um, and we got the data on the evening of the election results. And so we created this website, which is a full text search on any, and you can just go to it. It's on elections, open knowledge of the e. We, we, we are, we hosted the open data point of the election results on the evening with weird things because politicians, if you were uh, Karim Achten, you could now every minute check how many votes you had. Before that, you couldn't, because only the national non-politicians would get like dashboards. And so the interesting thing we found out, because we asked like, who's buying this? One political party was buying the real-time feed, last elections and this one. So some politicians, political parties saw the value of that. And why? It's because you get very local voting station information which you can then use for your campaigns next time around. If you don't buy that real-time data set, you get aggregated. And so I let you imagine which, uh, on which part of the spectrum that political thing, political part, was not what nobody needs to do. They can only use it. No? But so it's, it's quite shocking to me that it took 2019 for us to open it. It's also weird that our little non-profit is now the, the publication point of the real-time election year. It should be gone. So by next time they fix it. But to the honor of uh, some government officials, they came with the contract and said, the contract said you should open it. Because, yeah, but we're not really selling the data, it's a support contract, you know? And so we had real support from legal people in the government to open another part. And the second interesting part is you talked about size and you talked about those great intercommunales and, and non-profits. So there have been historically a lot of 
this need of small communes, small cities coming together. So we're too small to build it ourselves, but if the five of us in this region do this, we can make it, right? So this is started in the 80s and the 90s, and now oh, we can hire those IT brokers that are so hard to find. And so with all that good intention, we start an intercommunal. And oh, we look across the border, and they also have an intercommunal. They do what we do. We should come together. We now have a bigger intercommunal. We now have 100 employees in experts in data and processing and building apps for cities. And those things become their own beast. They and so this was being exploited by one of those intercommunals. It's called Sivadis. Nice people, good people. But so it was the government owning, because they're owned by the, by, the, by the local governments, they were owning the company selling election data. So it's an own goal in all respects. And then the, the, the craziest thing is that the government owns ATS. This is a long story, but I'll try to keep it short. They own an insurer, bankrupt or insurance investment company. And they bought NFB, which is a very big, initially volume based into agro one. And they bought see like this. And so you have this spider web of interconnected, not for profit initially companies that became for profit because they need to feed the bees. They have 100 people into sell licenses to, to, to cities now. And so this is something extremely complex for the government to manage because now they have to almost sue the, own, the companies they own, not opening for the greater good. So this is something complex. We can have long political discussions about this. Public funding, public benefits. That's why we're talking open access. I'll be short about this one because it's farther away from the subject of tonight. But we think from open knowledge that if, if academic work is uh, majority paid for by the public, grants or and, uh, the wages of the researchers, then the end result should be open, public, and free and reusable too, including the, search, uh, the, the, the research results. And this is not the case today. There's a few big uh, players, not to name them, Miguel Zavir is one of them, and they have great revenue models. They earn four times because they make the, the academic people pay for it. If you want to have your color picture and color graphs in there, you pay. They, they get peer, almost free peer reviewed boards where academics, the, the well known ones with a lot of prestige, get to decide what's being published. They sell subscriptions. If you want to open it, you need to pay more, more for license fees to get and distribute the content written by the researchers who work in the university, paid for by the university. So this is the open access movement, where we fight to say this is not normal. If you have government subventioned research data, they should be open to that. And Europe has a great recommendation, again, we don't know for that, so there's another directive, uh, which is now getting into effect on itself. I'll zip to the in healthcare, do classification in, in, in if, you, if you talk about ML and machine learning, it's one of the most mature fields. And so if you would open health data, I don't want to know the patients, so the GDPR, we don't have to discover it, discuss it. But if I would know that this one has cancer and that one not, and that two doctors look at that, I can use it as a very valuable trading data set. And there's lots of medical imaging with text linked to it around in the world. So you can just strip it from the privacy, sensitive information, and just say, this is a man and woman of that age with that background, with that medical history, and this is what we have in him. And you can make the, the models are beating the human doctors. The doctors don't like this because it's very uncomfortable for them. And this will be the reality for a lot of professions. It's very uncomfortable to see a machine being better or what you thought you were so good and creative and well trained for, because the machines are beating humans. But that's and Kaggle is one of those platforms. Everybody knows Kaggle. Or does somebody not know Kaggle? Okay, so it's a marketplace. If you have a data science project, you put it on there. You don't always need this one gets 250,000 euro. And teams from all over the world, this one has 257 players from 223 teams. They fight to find the best fitting model for the challenge that you've given them. They will crunch the data, come up with correlations or whatever you want in there, and then the winner gets the money. So it's a, it's a global platform to get data science talent to work on your, on your challenge. So this is a new economic model. You could throw the Ghent data set in there and say, instead of organizing the, the Ghent apps, we're looking for insights. Here are 50 data sets from the city of Ghent. We're working on mobility. Come up with the, the best fitting model to get this. And then, of course, you need to set certain goals. We want this outcome. We want less car time. We want to see the evolution of bike. What was correlated with getting more bikes uh, in the city? But that's a, so the policy setting part of it. You can use that. 
I'll go very quickly on those. Yes, that's data for good and for bad. So we, we were using uh, data and open data of airline, airplane data, and then NASA made an algorithm to make them use less fuel. Because you can use software for the goods. If you put a, a nice flight plan in there and you don't go up too quickly, and, and you can save a lot up to 10% of the time, if I recall well, on certain parts of the flight. And so you're saving a lot of CO2, so you're making contribution to the environment and the world. But as we've seen, you can also use it for bad. The, the Volkswagen diesel basically was just a sensor with a, with some, that, that, that would trigger the fact that, oh, I'm standing in a lab. You're only making two of the four wheels run in the, in the, in the, in the lab. So I'm going to get less uh, exhaust. I'm going to put in some more of this fluid with the, with the fuel so that we have less exhaust. This is, we would consider it for bad, but somebody had to think it up. This, this, this did not end up in those cars by mistake. Somewhere, somebody had to put in a sensor, had to write a software, had to test it, and had to, had to document it as well. This is not one engineer somewhere that went wrong for an uh, incentive that we found in action. Another one, companies open. <coughs> any from NG in the room, by any chance? No, because more and more companies are opening up the data sets of this is IoT, with big, uh, uh, I'm told that a, a big windmill like this generates one gigabyte of data a day. Hmm? One gigabyte of data. There's so many sensors in there that it's generating one gigabyte of data a day. And so some companies are opening up the raw data. This is about the tension on the structure, uh, on, on, on the, the vibration on every part. It's because they can use it for preventive uh, maintenance. If you get more vibrations on a part, it means something is not going as fluid as it should be. And so. That's why these things are rigged with sensors. So companies are opening this up. And so I'm urging all of you when you work in a private company, open data is not something that's just for the government. You as a company or as an organization can contribute with your data sets too. And you can organize a hackathon or go to Ken and say, hey, this is mobility. Maybe if we, if we throw in all the windmill data, somebody comes up with a nice application. Unwanted reuse. The Strava one, you all know it. No, then I'll talk about it. <laughs> so one of those fitness trackers, Travis one by the old place. They, so they made a huge effort like, oh, somebody, I can, I can see the meeting. We need content. We have all the people in the world running somewhere. Oh, that would be great content if we do a, a map, a heat map of the world where people have running trails. Great, we're going we're gonna to staff 10 people on it next week. Anonymize it because we don't want you to be able to see that the same person runs from there. Okay, they anonymize the set, they launch the project, and then people start zooming in on the globe, this is not the one, and they find this pattern. In the middle of the desert in Afghanistan, a secret army base. So it was anonymized. You do not know which army men and women are running around there, but you do know there's a base there. And so for the, for the army, there's definitely unwanted information leaking to their paid employees who have a private tracker that's being synced and send in the cloud when they get back to the US or whenever they're on the Wi-Fi in the days, or I don't know how it was uploaded. But so perfectly anonymized, but unwanted reuse. And so again, think very well when you open data sets, there might be unwanted reuse. Every year, we, uh, we in Open Knowledge International have a ranking based on many different things and how open the data sets are. And we see there's many, many different things. So PSI is Public Service Information, it's a directive. It's overdue. Um, the, the real implementation, even for Belgium, the law is there, but Colin can just the world decree is still missing. So, that one. Um, it, basically, it takes a lot of time, anything you want to build on it. That's like one of the main messages. It's really been a decade, I started in Ghent as one of the trailblazers of this movement. And we're a decade later, and we start to see some maturity becoming reality. Yeah? But it's taking a long, long, long time. Um, and and uh, yeah, the end goal is to have link data. We're far from that. And so a part, a part of the value you can add is by doing that. And so my cookbook in data, and for all of you building database applications, there's open data, we talk a lot about it, there's public data, is the part where there probably is a license involved somewhere, but people reuse it. So that's what you scrape. They're everybody reusing uh, Facebook data. You're not supposed to, but it's on the internet. So, you know, people that expose it on the internet, why can't I reuse it for my insurance? I have to know where people, uh, which risks they take in their private lives so I can that my model to it. That's public. Again, watch out with the reuse. And it's a, you should do that. And just saying public data is there, but you should check 
if you if you can reuse it for what you want. And then there's closed data. That's the whole part where you typically have to log in a password and some authentication, your bank data, your your medical files. You don't want it to be public. But for all of you who know, uh, have I been pawned? This uh, website that is collecting all the data breaches of passwords. Type your oldest password, your oldest email in there. You'll be surprised in how many data breaches do pop up. Those were all sites where you had to register with a login and a password, so probably part of the closed data side. So even if it's closed data, a lot of it is uh, unopened in the in, uh, unofficial ways. In, when you have data flow types, static dynamic, so something structured and unstructured. So what, what my company mostly does in data is we have a lot of unstructured data and we structure it, but it is mostly static. A stats block page gets published and that's it. A stock exchange changes every millisecond. The temperature, it's a very dynamic value that will go up. You have a data stamp on it, but uh, it's, it will still uh, be very dynamic. Uh, and so the real value to me, the only data grid is combining those. So if you have somebody, let's take bank accounts, you take the and the and the, and the bank. If I now combine this with public data and open that, I can create a lot of value for my bank account users by by helping them reusing cross matching that sort of information. Especially with a new directive PS2 coming up, where banks have to open up your bank account with your consent with third parties. And so as of September. Expect to see a lot of innovation happening in fintech. I'm also active in that in that uh, niche, uh, where a lot of new players will try to convince you to give them your consent to do all sorts of advanced stuff with your bank, historic bank account data or on bank to your payment agree and the aggregation of accounts, initiation on your behalf of a transaction. Um, if you build an app, where can you get value from? Notifications. I'll give you an example in that be e. If you follow a company, every time they publish a new bylaw, a new address, a new stakeholder, we send you an email in the morning. Hey, something happened there. If that's your customer or if that's your supplier, it's nice to know. Should I reach out? Should I ignore? But it's a notification. People like it. It's one of the major traffic drivers in our company. We have 10,000 visitors per day on the website. We have over 100,000 registered users. We get this for free. It's a freemium model. So you let people use it. But it's based on open data. If you would go to Stars, but every day, you don't need my notification. You just avoid the need for you to go to the site or the source and send it. Real time data, of course, uh, getting time series out there and historic data and trends, those two, by looking at annual accounts to, to stick to the data of the E1, you have the situation today. If I show you the last five years, it's a lot more meaningful. You'll see a trend without being an accountant. The social graph and business graph show you relationships. Entities. Ah, I have a business address. What else do I have at this address? What, what, which other companies does this person own? We made those graphs. Uh, graphs. Uh, building a mobile app is still fashionable, it's still handy. It's still, if you look around this room, most of you are holding mobile phones. There's only one person taking notes on a laptop. Yeah? <laughs> so, mobile phone is a good device to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to engage with your end users. Visualizations, they say more than a thousand words. So if you look at business models, I'll try this one out. Big um, data is in the all right, I don't think so. It's all for artificial intelligence. One of the things that puzzles me, that's the elder people in the room, this is almost an age test. If you know what this is. Punch cards. Yeah, punch cards, punch cards. And so my punchline is a punch card. <laughs> this thing, I always have to laugh on it. I'm a bit of a track, so that's not a punch card. But all those captchas, you encounter them. It's just a stupid race from human. Because this is a computer generating a code for you to show that you're human, and at the same time, there's captcha breakers that are trying to overcome this. And then there's humans who build revenue models in making you break them for them for free. So it's a it's it's something completely insane that we and and, and so yeah, that's my. It's AI. It's everything in there. Because to break them, you need a lot of uh, a lot of compute power to do that. Or you can take the human way. And for example, there's I know there's porn sites where they where they will let people to get the paid content. They show them three captures that are generated elsewhere. They break them. They get free access, and they use those captures to go to the website that's using the captures to, to, to shield information. So it's another model. So it's humans beating to side models, the captures, and computers breaking them in a more automated way. Anyway. Um, 
history of uh, AI. The first one, it was a human insight, and I think there's still a lot of human insight in many of the AI that we have been watched as well. Um, I want to go a bit quicker here. Before I dive into this one, so this is uh, some screenshots from data.de, give you an example about address data and the city of Kent policy. So I have a 19 year old son sleeping uh, in a sort of in he has a cot, but this cot happens to be an apartment. And so there's a weird situation because the last few days he says, Dad, we have a cop at the door every day now. We're not going down anymore. I said, Why not? Because there's a movement. The city of Kent wants to slap fines on students living in apartments. What's that? So you need apartments in my name. So if you look at those, you're looking at you, uh, but the reason they're, they're using the police to get better quality data, which is insane because I have a registered rental contract in Ghent by the federal government, but the city of Ghent doesn't have access to it. So they need to send police officers to go ring doors and to ask the neighbors, do you happen to know of the students living here on the first floor? And if so, can we get in so they can do a constat and then send a thousand euro or 900 euro fine to the owner, which will then rebuild me with this fine. So this is policy setting and quality data at the same time showing how tough that is. Correct? I'm not familiar with all the details, but it's true that uh, we fear that the students yeah. taking up the residences for families. Yeah. But it's true that we have a big data problem because yeah. we don't know where the students are. Yeah. We don't know where the empty houses are. So in this case, police force, which is expensive, is doing door-by-door -door checks in certain neighborhoods. And so at the other hand, at the other side, this information is stored at another government level because it's a registered contract. And the contract has a clause about this, saying, if I, as the owner, get slapped by extra taxes, I will, you will have to pay them to me. So it's it's very, it's going to be interesting. My son, my son knows that. I can tell the story uh, next week. So let's hope that the cops don't find him before uh, he moves <laughs> out. Because then there will be a retroactive uh, uh, side. It shows how tough policy and that and how, how, in, how linked they are. And how this, this, if you don't link it together, you don't have it, but then there's privacy. You know? Why would the city have to know that uh, I have a second uh, residence in Ghent? Well, I live in Brussels. And why does it make a difference if I have a mattress living there or my son? And who should be allowed to police this? And what if the, the girl who lives there says to the police agent, yes, I know this man. He's my boyfriend. So do they have to investigate it then or not? And so you're getting into all sorts of muddy waters because at the basics, the police, the, and I understand and I fully support the city saying we need enough housing apartments for young professionals. But there's not enough housing for the students. So the one project creates overspill in the other, and so everything is interconnected. Anyway, so then this is a short one on addresses and data. Um, we just combine these sources, put them in a page, so you can find the information that you find there on three government websites, and it's the same. But we get 10,000 visitor days for doing that. So if you, just the wrapping up of the data has value. And then showing graphs, if I show you this, you don't see what's happening. It's numbers. You have to use your brain. If I show you that three accounting years, you see the evolution. So that's a visualization part. Small things. It's the same data. The data, you can go and get it for free. Yet getting this, you're willing to pay for it. Some people are willing to pay for it, especially if it's a professional interest. Now, this is the part where I thought about, talked about, you take your bank statement. This is an example from one bank. You upload it. <coughs> Then you can see, oh, people paying me, that must be my customers. Me paying others, that must be my suppliers. When you link those account numbers with the companies, which part of the has done as a link, you can show which companies are in good shape, which ones are growing, which ones are local. You can map them. You can do all sorts of stuff. You can notify. You can show new prospects. Here are similar companies as the ones paying you today. Because once you have aggregated the data, and that's where your value is. The value for me of the data itself is going to zero. Data brokers in the old model reselling what they scrape from government, I mean, that's a shitty model. You don't want to be in there. I want to be in this. I want to be there to show people, hey, you get insights from this data. By combining this, I can bring in new customers. You want to pay me for that, not for knowing where they are on a map. So that's the part you can make nice donuts. You can click, you can get this. I want to ask later. And so that's what we're dealing with. Maybe 
And I, I'm not going to run you through all the AI stuff and how to manage the time, how to get fourteen beneficiary owners, how to get the value of historic data points, because that's everything you get by aggregate. I want to go to some live demo on it. That's always more fun. It's one of the tough things I did by doing data collection, enrichment, data interactions. I almost bankrupted my company on something I thought it had to be done. And the thing I thought it had to be done is that we <coughs> took the Belgian Stasblad, so the Monitor Bush, the Belgian State Gazette, which is online from the mid 90s, 2002, depending in different formats and for different legal types and database, non profits, and so on. And I found a non profit that had collected unique collections since 1872. And so together with this other non profit, we did the scanning, which is a Really, the physical scanning of 4 million pages from 1872 to today. And so I was like, yeah, wow, it's great. We'll have a lot of timeline data. We can do semantics on the which notary with the graphs historically. If you have tag dodgers, they didn't start with your 70 year old man or woman. They started in the 60s and 70s. You should look at the origin when they weren't smart enough to hide her to go to Panama and to go to Cyprus. So that was a, my incentive to do this. And I'll find value later. So I can give you a demo of that. This is the first public demo. It's a not it's not a the, the search result itself is not public. But you can give me any street in Ghent. So I just type oh this is not a screen, so I'm gonna have to do this <coughs> my side I need to let's see if I can keep it myself or if I just can screen system preferences and now it's there. 2019, we're still trying to figure out on the screen and mouse. Mm -hmm. And where do I need to go to this place to get a collection? If anybody is quicker than me, then do directly at the mirror of this place will get it done. <coughs> Although the resolution is not quite what I hoped for. Yes. Yeah, so, this is a search engine. Let's Type me, yeah, so this is gone. I typed it all. The, so the first one is a document from 1873. I have the only online copy of this document. In Belgi Stasblad, they no longer have this because it's not deemed a valuable document. Because it's it was printed in Stasblad on thousands of copies. There's three copies in the National Library. They are falling apart. This is what we scanned. So it's point yeasma for those who like them. Like, and we managed to do OCR on that. So we spent four years in training our own OCR engines on this type of data. So we really went in the long side. So when I say I almost bankrupted my company, that's what I mean. I spent an insane amount of efforts on this. We look for the middle of the page and I say, oh, wow, you must be top data side. I mean, wow, you found the middle of the page. That must have been quite some hour. No, because it changes over time. Sometimes it's a fixed time. Some, sometimes the page is screwed when it gets So you need to adapt. Over the page for the list. Sometimes it's a dotted line. Sometimes there's no line. It's just space. So you need to you need to make that. Then you need to find the beginning. So we know in this year there's a number, a dash, a bolt, a dash. There. And so we cut all those publications in pieces so you cannot look for them. So now comes the fun part. You can look for your entrepreneurial family history. Mm -hmm. So any of you, give me. Oops, I'm in the wrong one here. Give me your family name or address. It's, uh, it's full text search. Also, <laughs> and you have to now give me your the writing of the last place. O E E U A A E U E A also like that. Also, sorry, I did go and now I do also. So all this, so the, this is the best match. I'll take the oldest first. So we're traveling to eighteen seventy six. Let's have a look at this. Act. So this is so as you see, we have an act that starts. So, there's text here, of course. It wasn't published. Yet. We found the beginning of this one where somebody with the name of Rousseau has been recognized. I should see if we can find that person very quickly. I trust all of you to scan with me. Um, so, so the second, second column. Uh, in the second yeah. column, you already saw it. Yeah. 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 yeah, so you now know that you had the Rousseau, and the nice thing is, can we see where it is happening? It was in Charleroi. So some of them. Yeah, that's the bad part of it. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking about that ethnic profiling going to a room and uh, so it all comes together. But I can, as we have entity recognition, so you see that we can say these are the names we found close to also Robert, John, Carol, Paul, Van Rooster, and somehow is linked often when you look for Rousseau. 
these are counters on the number of appearances they have. We can extend them to any other term here. I can look by city, so and since we have somebody, as you can see, we have, I'll, I'll show you the Gantt, so we'll do Gantt here, for we'll autocomplete, so we have 18 in Gantt too. And now I will select Gantt and Gantt, so as you know, Gantt was French speaking back in the day, so that's why we need to add both of them. So now I have only 51 results left with Rousseau. So Rousseau et Aimé, Société, ou non collectif, I got. Um, and you, we do edit extraction on the names in there. So luckily for us, most of those people are dead, so we won't have GDPR complaints. So just all of you know, if you want to hide stuff, hide it before you die, because you're one day you're hide. Now back to this one. We do we do extraction. So if in that text there is a profession with Désiré, Roseau, it's a madame, that's good that we recognize that. But we, we, we do not just recognize the name, but here we see that we have Augustin Rosan, Hamus Reazir, Braderin Strat number two. So this is, as you can see, this is not something that just rolls out of a piece of text you scan, right? This is, <coughs> many of you are more of you go like, yeah, well, well done. <laughs> Hundred thousands of users, zero revenues. Right? Mm -hmm. The only ones maybe willing to pay for it, I'll ask you the question, but if you want to do your family tree, how much would you pay to see the Rousseau's and to do your family tree? Damn, there goes my revenue model. Yeah, those great uncles with too much time. <laughs> I, I think I, because there's some gaps. And I, I think in, in the family tree business, uh, so you need to talk to the Mormons because they yes. have live stream projects. Yes, we know. But then that means I sell it once. They are actually interested. But you sell it once. In, because they're, they, yeah, you can say, you can say about the Mormons what you want, but running the most professional ancestors, ancestry is a website, is a number. It's like hundred millions of dollars in revenues in SaaS. SaaS, these guys know software as a server better than many of the startups. Mm -hmm. building, yeah? They upsell and cross sell all the genetic the, the gene data. And they now start cross, cross matching that with DNA data. So genetic data. And you're combining both. It's the Mormons. Because according to their religion, they have to track anybody who ever lived. So if uh, the day comes that there is a case, everything is in the book. And everybody will live on happily forever. Or that's my short version of it. I'm sure there's more nuance to it. <laughs> so this is one example where you can get an unstructured data set, which is not changing anymore. Four million pages that are stuffed in archive are being thrown away. Part of this archive comes from the University of Kent, it is thrown in containers. And somebody called the nonprofit and I was like, they're throwing away the archives. And so they're going to pick it from the, from the details containers and do triage, store it, and find the good copies and put the good copies. So, insane, insane example. So, this is the <coughs> tears from the trenches. Doing something where you see value, seeing a business model, and not being able to find anybody putting their money where their mouth is. Do you think 